Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. I figured that uh, the Chinese educational system was was wasting my time. Right? Really? Yeah. It, because, I, I, I mean, they seem to be pretty good at some things. It, they are good. They're very good. Yeah. But, but, you know, it's very limiting. I, I, I can't really get to do or learn the things I really want to learn. Howdy there, pitch workers. It is Wednesday. It is Scott, and this is the Pitchworks Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. I have a really intriguing guest for you this week. Jackson Wang is in from Quebel Solutions, Quebel Technology. There's some there's some interesting conversations about staying up all night, apparently. Uh, I don't know how he does it. Yeah, I just blame the fact that he's young. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about how you can interact with us. And that would be through the social media channels that we've laid out there for you. You can always find it at Pitchworks, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S. And you know, there's a website that goes with all of this too, because it just wouldn't be complete without it. Throw the E in works and come visit us at pitchworks.com. Make sure you, uh, you reach out to us through any of those channels whenever it's convenient. If you want to tell us, hey, I found somebody that would be a great guest, or hey, that last show was an absolute stinker. Either way is fine. We can take it. Take the same attitude into iTunes for me and give us a rating and review while you're thinking about it. So let's talk about uh, Quebble. Let's talk about Jackson. Let's talk about apparently just inventing himself the whole way through, which I think a lot of us wish we had the courage to do. Let's jump into this interview. Allow me to extend a welcome to Jackson Wang, Quebble Technologies. How's it going, man? Good. I'm good. How are you? Well, I... Uh, you told me some interesting things, and right. I really wish the first time you had said them, we had a microphone in front of your face. So thank you for coming in. I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank and you, you being here is a big me. part of that. Thanks. Um, let's jump right in. So, sure. uh, Quebble, you are, if I'm, if I'm not doing you a disservice, right, uh, contract sort of software development, and you're turning a lot of your attention toward People who want to be startups or, or you know, they want to offer new products, you know, they're exi an existing company maybe, and they want to offer something new. You're offering them an outsourced opportunity rather than, you know, having to hire somebody in-house. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know, there's a lot of problems, um, potential issues if you hire in-house team. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, you, you have a lot of overhead expenses. You got to pay the salary, the office and all that stuff. And you also have to, you know, put in the hour. Uh, in the time to to um, actually interview every uh, person that will come on your on your team, right? You're you're touching on something that I'm actually pretty sensitive to, which okay. is that <laughs> I wouldn't know how to hire. Like right, I wouldn't right. know what skill set I was looking for. And I mean, I'm a fairly technically savvy person from a high level. Like I understand the difference between maybe, um, you know, these different types of languages and where they get used. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's good at it and right. who's bad at it though. Right. A lot of people don't know how to judge, you know, their, the, the, the people's skills, right? right. Yeah, that's what I mean. they're not developers. They, they don't have the knowledge to actually see, okay, you did well on this and you, you're not, you know, a good fit for this position, right? So yeah. they would have to find another person, you know, coming and then the same issue still exists because you don't know if the other person has that skill. How to do you judge. trust that exactly. person? Now? Yeah. yeah, the, the exactly. trust chain keeps becoming a problem. Right, right. But, you know, like... Uh, that issue still exists, you know, for agencies and us too. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing. But the, the thing is with us, you know, we have reviews and we have clients that you can prove what we do and, and the things that, you know, we help, uh, we do to help um, uh, uh, startups or companies like yours. Is some part of your customer base larger, more established custom customers, like businesses that, you know, are just looking to maybe create some add on to their existing set or are you specifically going after these early stage companies? We want to go in and, uh, you know, help these companies maybe redesign their website, yeah. maybe, um, come up with a new, you know, service or a channel that can bring more customers and, and eventually revenue for them, uh, through an online, you know, uh, platform, things like that. But we spend 80% to 90%, you know, chasing, uh, startups, tech startups and, and high growth companies that really need our service, uh, for, you know, maybe two years and then they get enough investment or revenue that they can 
hire an in-house team and we yeah, can help can them transition kind of at that exactly point. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah we can like help them transition into that phase as well okay so i have a million questions right sure, go ahead <laughs> all right um and you have a fascinating story so don't let me get too far off the track here but mm-hmm. um there's a lot of people out there who are getting into startup culture reading startup blogs and those kinds of things because unfortunately it's fashionable and i say unfortunately because i think it's an escapist sort of a thing as opposed to like a real decision on their part to build something try something and 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 Mm -hmm. get into it you have to at some level be a little bit frustrated by how many sort of tire kicking people you would talk to. Right. Because you are kind of like the magic, you're the genie who grants the wishes, right? <laughs> you're like, well, I have the best idea. And you're like, okay, well, you know, how much money do you have behind your idea? Right. W- well, I could put my own money into it. And you find out that, you know, they have $3,000. Mm. And, and I mean, I'm guessing, but I am assuming that that's nowhere near enough to create that iOS app that they have no. on, in mind or that, that, you know, database driven multinational website right. they're trying to create. So, you know, put me somewhere in the neighborhood. Like, is there an average number where somebody who wants to do, I don't know, a, a phone app would spend or a, a website app would spend? I, I don't want to put you on the spot in terms of numbers, but I think it's informative. So, I actually wrote a uh, uh, an article recently and I posted it on LinkedIn. Uh, Sorry, I didn't read it. I, I probably should have just done that. <laughs> it, it's called "How Much Do Developers Cost in 2017?" Okay, right in the U.S. Um, so basically, you know, it really depends on. This is kind of like a market rope. It's not like it's not like a grocery store. You just go in and there's a tag on it. It, it depends on you know a lot of factors that uh, will come into uh, uh, the product. For example, um, you know how how skilled are your developer, yeah. right? Right. What language do they use? And have they built stuff like this before? Right. Um, and what kind of uh, functions that you really need in your uh, app or website or any product mm-hmm. that will actually target, you know, your customer. So you got to do your homework first yeah. before you talk to, you know, any agency or us, right? But the the general number would be, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that this you is don't like know. official number. Yeah, but I'm not trying estimation. to hold you to anything, obviously. Everything's right. got to be custom and it, there's got to be a spec doc, I'm, I'm assuming. You're writing up a scope of work for yourself and things that aren't included in your scope of work obviously are extra or you know just not even possible, mm-hmm. right? I'm just trying to give people a sense of it. Right. So, uh, for example, you know, if you want it, something like uh, uh, Uber or maybe, you know, some functional app that will actually do something, not just, you know, screens and stuff um, that will involve, you know, a server, right, obviously, and front end, which is iOS or Android or both. Right. And then you need like a UI designer, Mm -hmm. right, Uh, quality assurance and things like that. Um, I think the general price would be somewhere between 150,000 to 200,000, 200,000. But, uh, you know, a lot of startups with, let's say, half a million uh, investment, right? Yeah. Um, if they spend that much money on an app, they will be left with like, you know, 50% of money uh, to run their marketing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we can come in and lower the price, but uh, guarantee to give you the same quality or even better quality. So what we provide is like really simple thing. We try to uh, increase the ratio between value and price, right? Right. So we want to help these companies grow, and and we want to be the one that you know uh, p- people know us as. They are the guys that help those you know companies grow and become something big, right? So we're, wait, let's just slow down to make sure everybody catches up right. with, with where we're at. So you're saying if they were going to try to develop that themselves, mm. they were going to hire a team, and they knew who to hire. Which mm. again, I still think is a giant sticking point in this whole conversation. Is you can't know unless you, you yeah. unless you already did study it. Right. You do. You can't really know. Right. You're saying something like a interactive e-commerce type app that okay. looks different than everybody else's. You're figuring about one fifty to two hundred thousand dollars is what they would spend, or is that through an agency? That's through an agency. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I just wanted to make sure because you know I do think this is and tremendously that number might useful be too for people. Low. For for agency, yeah, yeah, that's that's probably the starting price if you want something like all functional and everything good, you know. Oh what yeah, I mean? well, I mean, it's not uncommon to see somebody just with one area of mm-hmm. specialty making a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars themselves, right? Um, but I need people to hear it from somebody who knows what they're talking about, and that happens to be you, right? I right. can say it, and I can say, well, that's a pattern I've seen, or these are salaries that I've noticed people making. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it's important that some of the folks that are 
legitimately holding on to a potential business in their head or, mm-hmm. or, or on paper somewhere it's actually underway, somebody needs to say to them, these are agency numbers that yes. we, we've actually seen for deployment of a truly unique, useful tool of one, so, one sort or another that people would spend money on. Yes. Now, you said you're, you're working to bring that down. How are you doing that? So, well, before I get to that, you know, there's this thing that uh, I think you and the audience should know. Yeah. Uh, for if you go to an agency, uh, I'm not saying 100% all agencies do this, but most agencies, you know, they they will have five developers or designers work on multiple projects at one time, right? So if you go in, you become one of the uh, clients that they they have. So uh, something that can be done, you know, in two, three weeks will be dragged to like three months, four yeah. months, right? I've come across like stories like this all the time, right? And because, you know, you need a team of different positions to work on one product. It's not, a lot of people think it's just one or two people. It, 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 it can't. It can't be. It, right, it can't be. Or it just be, a, you know, a crappy product. That will, yeah, right. You, you will have a lot of problems down, down the road. Well, so, there's database specialists. And yeah, I mean, this goes back to what you said just a couple of minutes ago. There's yeah. a UI person. There's right, a right, person exactly. who makes sure that it'll be distributed across, you know, all these different servers and balanced correctly, right? right? That, I mean, you have There'd to be take quality that assurance, into, you know, yeah. a lot of these people. So if you go to an agency, they will, uh, you know, have maybe assign four or five people to, to work on your product, but at the same time, they're working on other projects as well, right? So your product, as a, especially as a startup company, doesn't really get 100% attention, maybe you know, 40, 50% attention of all these guys. So what we do is uh, we try to bring that up. So we only uh, offer full-time designers and developers. Right. So if you come to us, our, we'll form, form a team just for you and that they, they, they work on your product and they won't work on anything else, right? They're full-time. And we lower the price uh, by uh, using distributed teams in China or Asia region. We have a whole interview you know, a process and, and all that to make sure our designers are good, our developers are uh, super you know, experienced, and they can get the job done and the way you want within the, the uh, reasonable deadline. Okay. Right? So you're, you're working with teams right. that the people here in, in the U.S. market really don't have access to mm-hmm. because they're not set up to make the payments over there mm-hmm. in Asia, right? Mm-hmm. right? They're not set up to interview those people, uh, being able to even run an ad right. to bring those people in for an interview <laughs> right. is a significant challenge. Right. Um, and I'm assuming part of it is just a uh, cost of living difference and those kinds of mm-hmm. things where they're asking for lower wages than maybe somebody who was here or, or some of the hotbeds where these developers live. Now, when, when you're putting this all together though, Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a fairly daunting sort of project to manage. Mm -hmm. And, and let's say you are the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. If you get to pick the perfect time for somebody to call and hire you, what stage is that? Do you want to be involved in the conceptual bit or are you just basically like, Hey, throw us your project and we'll just make sure you have a budget. So I think the perfect stage for a startup, uh, let's talk, talk about startup first and then, you know, other small businesses right. after as the second category. So for startups, I would say, you know, if you have uh, maybe $200,000 investment, um, $300,000, so we'll bring the, uh, the price down so you can make the product happen. Right, like a base, then, base design, a minimum viable product oh, kind no, no, of a no, build. More, more than minimum uh, vi- okay. MMP. So functional and it looks good, right? But uh, the price is low, and you will have maybe enough money left for marketing and other costs. That, that's where we're talking about two hundred thousand dollars investment. Got it. Right. So the second category would be you know small businesses. So we also help some local businesses you know improve their website, just the, the general stuff that a lot of people are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but since we have this advantage of you know the, the ratio between value and price, so might as well just help some small businesses and you know get our reputation up. And we really want to help those companies transi- uh, transition you know from um, maybe a store or you know a, a shop into something that they can do online to bring more customers and revenue as well and yeah. also help them you know bring up their reputation right because if you let's be honest if you visit a website and it looks just like back in the 70s you, you wouldn't trust that company that much you know I mean, you you a lot of people will have uh, the the doubts and be like oh why why is this coming I'll put it to you a different so way bad. um the ways that we look for trust often look more like investment. Right. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the person who calls you at your house gets less attention from you as a sales rep mm. because it's a minimum effort approach at you, mm -hmm. right? It's right, like, right. look, you spent as little as you could on this interaction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, someone who, I don't know, sends you a really nice full-size fold-out brochure to your home that you mm -hmm. can open a page through and you go, wow, this company. With a, with a customized, you know, design box and all that, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Maybe it has your name. Exactly, like, yeah. Like work into, they have that, that what, dynamic printing where it mm -hmm. says your name and, you know, it shows things that, that you've shown interest in. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've invested a significant amount in this touch. Mm -hmm. So you must be a higher end, more trustworthy. You're not just some scam. Yes. Right? Yes. And that, <laughs> I think that's what you're trying to say. Right. Now, you were actually born in China. Yeah. Now, there's so much we could get into there. <laughs> yeah, right? let's do it. <laughs> I was born in China, mm -hmm. uh, and I grew up there. Uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, my parents sent me away to Shanghai. Uh, I wasn't born in Shanghai. That's another city. Uh, they wanted me to live by myself when I was 10 years old. How they, far away? Uh, about two and a half hours by flight. Wow. Yeah. So that's a significant trip. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty far, yeah. So your parents, you were born in China. Right. You get to 10 years old. Yes. <laughs> and they're like, you're out. <laughs> Have you ever seen Home Alone? And you're like, no. <laughs> like, you're going to live it now. Yeah. Is that basically it? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Especially yep. with the robbers, you know, <laughs> trying to invade the house. Yeah. So I moved to Shanghai, you know. Um, I remember the very first day, I, you know, I couldn't speak the local language. Okay. Because uh, you, you, in China, you know, every city, every region has their own dialect. Right. Right. Shanghai, Shanghai has Shanghainese, and I, I couldn't speak the language. I, I, I don't understand anybody there. Wow. Right? And I was by myself. And you're a boy. Yeah. yeah. It was it was quite interesting, you know, at the beginning. Uh, I had to learn how to, you know, grow up and take care of myself at a very young age. And um, and then later, you know, I, I I kind of, I figured that uh, the Chinese educational system was was wasting my time. Right? Really? Yeah. It, because, I, I, I mean, they seem to be pretty good at some things. It, they are good. They're very good. Yeah. But, but, you know, it's very limiting. I, I, I can't really get to do or learn the things that I really want to learn. Right? That's a powerful word. It's limiting. Yes. What did you want to learn that you didn't learn? I don't know, just, you know, fun things as, as, as a kid, like I, I wanted to learn programming. Yeah. And my, my parents would think that's, you know, a waste of time because I'm not spending time on math or physics. Interesting. Right. And I, I, I like, I remember when I was little, my dad bought me uh, this, this toy car. Yeah. Remote car. And I, I didn't even play with it. I just oh, like boy. took it apart and really wanted to see yeah. what was inside. Right. So that's kind of like, I, I was what I was really interested in, but I wasn't really allowed or supported in school or in family to, to kind of, you know, go outside of what they asked me to learn and, and, and be interesting in other things. Right. For example, music, you know, I, I used to be a singer for, for a while. And that's also one of the things that they were really against. Um, so I, I thought the educational system was wasting my time. You know, every day what I do is just like prepare for tests, prepare for tests, prepare for tests every mm -hmm. morning, every night, you know, it was crazy. So I got to middle school and I said, okay, this is it. I don't, I don't want this anymore. Right. So I got an opportunity to go to Canada. Right. Vancouver, British Columbia, a beautiful city. So wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. Did you say middle school? Uh, yeah, and a middle school. Okay, so you're now how old? I think I was 16 or 17. Good 16, God. yeah. All right, keep going. So so now you're 16, and right. you're, you're not just two and a half hours on a flight away. Yeah, You're I'm, uh, literally <laughs> like on the other side of the planet. Right. Mom and dad didn't come, did they? No, no, no. Yeah, you would have said so, I figured, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just by myself. So I took the opportunity, and you know, I, I flew all the way there. It was my very, very first time. In another country, right? Yeah. I had never even been to like, you know, Taiwan or Japan and that that's near China. So that was the first time. And my English was bad. I'll be honest with you. Okay. My English was bad. I remember, you know, when I landed in the, uh, at the airport, uh, I tried to order some food <laughs> and I couldn't understand. I was so embarrassed, right? Yeah. So that was the first time. And I uh, went to Canada, went to high school there, attended, you know, four years of high school and finished it. Um, and then I figured, you know... Canadian educational system is kind of wasting my time. It's, it's limiting again. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, I really want to do a lot of things, but the school either um, doesn't have the resource for me to do or it, it just didn't feel right, you know? Yeah. So I said, you know what? Like everybody is going to the same college, you know, near Vancouver, uh, near home. So I, I'm already on the other side of the planet. So right. let's just go somewhere interesting, right? So I said, okay, I'll go to U.S. Um so I applied to a few uh, uh, colleges. Yeah. Uh, Pitt is one of them, right? Yeah. So I, I got into Penn State, actually, and uh, Pitt and Miami University. 
And uh, I didn't know where to go because I, I had never visited the United States, anywhere in the United States, right? Yeah. Um, but Pitt kept sending me emails and asking about, you know, how my grades were, blah, 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 yeah. the last semester. I said, okay, well, they're pretty interested, so let's check it out. So I decided to go to Pitt. And I came to Pitt. Uh, I attended, you know, I picked my major as computer science, as, yeah. you know, I've always been interested in uh, programming, developing, and, and creating stuff. Um, spent three years almost close to my graduation. I said, okay. Uh, I'm going to drop out. Did you really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but they sent you emails. <laughs> yes, they, they were did. so nice. <laughs> Look what you did. Yeah. So three years, you know, what I figured, I'm not saying any of this edu- uh, uh, education systems are terrible or something. I'm just saying it's not for me. Right. Mm-hmm. I have, a, I, have a, I tend to have a very clear self-awareness because the, you know, the way I grew up by myself and, and I try to take care of myself. So I think about myself and think to myself a lot. So I, I, I know exactly what I want and I know exactly, you know, what's good and what's bad for me. Okay. So uh, during college, you know, I just, I figured there are a lot of classes that I, I really, I can just learn online if I'm really interested. Right. Right. And I ended up doing that. You know what I mean? Like they don't teach mobile development here. They don't really teach server side, like uh, architecture sort of, you know, class here. Um, so I, I was really interested in this kind of stuff. So I was like, okay, well, you don't teach here. I'm going to learn online. So I just Googled it, right? Yeah. And then I spent nine months learning it. Literally every day, I just, I, I couldn't focus in class. Okay. Every, every class, I would bring my laptop and I would be doing my own programming. Doing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because, you know, the class content is not very interesting to me, right? Okay. And, um, and after three years, I said, okay, you know what? Um, I want to do business. And and I want to make this happen. I want to I, I want to use what I know uh, to to build something, right? It's it's always been like that for me. So I dropped out of school, and a lot of people ask me, um, "Hey, why do you do that? You have like thirty credits left to to graduate, right?" Yeah. And this is my honest honest answer. My answer would be, um, if I had graduated, I would have gotten a pretty good job, yeah, paying seventy eighty thousand dollars starting at least, right, nice. as a program yeah. developer, um. But I don't want that for me because if I get into that situation where I'm really comfortable, I don't know if I'll have the courage to put myself out there in risk to pursue something I really want. Uh, Comfort AKA, can be a trap. Right. Entrepreneurship, building my business, things like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I said that, you know what, let's let's just kill plan B. Yeah. So we're just, I'm just going to drop out. And I'm going to do this. If I can't make this happen, I'm going to be homeless. Well, that's a guts play. Right, so I, mean, I, don't, I don't want plan B. Only plan A can work. So I'm going to force myself to make plan A work. Now, while you're doing this, though, yeah, I mean, you have to have some sense of what you're trying to build, right? Yeah. Like, you kind of know where you think you're going to go from here. Right. It's different than just sort of randomly saying, like, <laughs> no, nah, I just think I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, no, honestly, like, there are people who just don't want to do what they're doing, and they're looking for an excuse just to stop doing mm-hmm. it. You mm-hmm. kind of, I think, you knew that there was this entrepreneurial thing that you were going to get into yeah, and you knew where you wanted to, to play. Mm -hmm. It's different than just, this is, this is boring. This is hard. This is confusing. I just don't want to do it anymore. Two very different things. Right. right. People confuse that. They, they, when they tell you, you only have 30 credits left, what they're trying to tell you is it didn't suck that (laughs) bad. Right. Exactly. Oh, come on. It didn't suck that bad. Yeah, Yeah. And you're saying, no, 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 no. I wanted to build something different. I had it stuck it like a splinter in my brain and I needed right. to get it out. Exactly. You know, I kind of knew that early on when I was in uh, middle school and high school. You know, I, I used to sell t-shirts to other students, right. snacks, like during, you know, lunch break. I, you know, I, I made like, uh, I think 8000 or $10,000 in one semester when, wow. I, as a kid. So, you know, I, I, I kind of um, just knew early on that I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I wanted to build something that, that belongs to me. I, I screwed up a few companies. I failed. Wow. And I learned a lot of things. And uh, I just At least kept you going. own it, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you fail and you, this is how you do with startups or any company or any, any business, right? Yeah. You experiment, you fail, and you just do it again. You know, like if, if you can just well, go out there. hopefully not exactly the same way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so if you can <laughs> just go luck, out there. With any luck, it's a little bit different. <laughs> right. If you can go out there, like map out all the mistakes that you can possibly learn from other people, you know, from yourself, yeah. from every time you do this thing, it's kind of like practice, you know, a sport, right? You just learn and you become better and better every time. And eventually, if you don't give up and you have the dedication to putting 100% effort every single time, and then you would just, you know, become great. That's how like greatness is, is created. You know, it's, it's based on this kind of like um, repeated um, action. That it's you the do. old 10,000 hours thing, right? How many employees are you working with now? 
Um, you know, we don't really have employees per se, but yeah. uh, there are distributed teams in China. So we have now about uh, 10 to 20 developers yeah. and designers, uh, some product managers and uh, um, engineers uh, working on a few uh, different projects for some U.S. clients right now. So how are you doing that? Because you're doing the, the I'm going to say, project management mm -hmm. and sort of make checking the work of those teams mm -hmm. who are on a totally different schedule than you. Right. Are they turning it in at the end of the day and then you're checking it, you know, when you wake up? Because you have to be you have to be awake with us to come market yeah. here, right? Yeah, you have yeah. to go do the mixers and the handshakes and the meetings right. and those kinds of things, which means you're not awake on China time no, making I am. sure that this code is written. You just don't <laughs> sleep is what you're telling me. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, you know, um it's it's not really uh something that I do um it's like, you know, uh, morning, you check in with me, and then by the end of the day, you show me this and that. Because a lot of functions and, and implementations take more than one day, right? Yeah. It might take a few weeks or a few months. So what, what we do on a daily basis is basically communication. A lot, a lot of communication, right? Mm -hmm. Through phone calls, Skype, FaceTime, texting, uh, Slack group, and things like that. So uh, I usually get up, you know, uh, around 8 or 9 a.m. in the morning so I can uh, communicate with our clients. Yeah. So, you know, U.S. time zone. But I would stay up until three or four every, not every day, but most of the nights. And I'll, 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 you know, if there's something I need to talk to my team or developers, I'll do it at night. And uh, I try to sleep around five hours a day, so I don't, yeah. I don't lose my mind. <laughs> but um, mo yeah, that's that's most. How old are you? Most time. I'm 25. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Savor the flavor while that lasts. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're gonna yeah. hit about 33, and you'll be yeah. like yawning at 11 o'clock, and right. the wife's gonna look at you and be like, "We should go upstairs. It's, <laughs> uh, it's sleepy time." <laughs> so now that you're now that you're kind of established, mm -hmm. right? You said you've had other companies, you've done other things. Yes. Um, and they, you know, they were failures that you learned from, right? right. What did right. you learn? Uh, so many things. I don't even know where to start with, you know? That's a good thing. Um, um, I, I learned that, I guess the most valuable thing I learned from the, the, the failures I've had is that you know nothing. You know, yeah. you, 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 a lot of people tell them, you know, hey, I, 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 they just tell themselves that I, I know or I guess, but most of the time it's, it's assumptions yes. that you have, right? It's the gut feel yeah, that right. feels like it should be true. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying don't, don't use your, you know, your, your gut feeling. I'm saying that really judge um, um, objectively if, if, it, if you're being emotional or you, if you're analyzing all the data and, and predicting what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. That's probably what I learned, uh, the biggest thing I've learned from my, my uh, failures and mistakes is that, um, you know, whenever I encounter something, either a problem, a challenge, or some change that I wanna make within the company, I'll go to my advisors and, you know, five, six, seven of them, I'll go to my parents, I'll go to my uncle, my uncle does business too, by the way. Oh, I'm sure, so, yeah. You know, I would go to my, my, uh, my wife and, and everybody I know and I'll ask them, what do you think, right? So it's like looking at, you know, a cup uh, right in front of you, you can't really see what it looks like 3D if you're just sitting there not moving, right? So you got to go around 360 degrees to see the exact you know, full picture of the thing. You need other people's perspective. Exactly. So that's the thing I, uh, most important thing I've learned from my mistakes. So how's the, how's the sales pitch looking? Are you feeling good about it? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get the feeling like, like sometimes when you come to people, you've got more energy than they do. I usually do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're talking faster than they're, than they're hearing you. Really? <laughs> I'm thinking. Which is amazing. When did you start learning English? Uh, I mean, you know, they teach English in China, but it's kind of like if you learn Chinese in America, you're not going to be able to speak it or, right. you know, actually have a conversation. Because, I mean, you're really quick. And that, I mean, that's, take that as the compliment that it is, honestly. Like, yeah, so, the fact that you're thinking that quickly and coming up with these technical responses to my questions, and, you know, and talking that fast, right? But people need that moment to think about what you just <laughs> said and what it means, right? Right, right. And I just, like, I love your energy. I do. I think right. more people need your energy. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, though, if you're, like, sometimes just blowing the doors off people, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do that sometimes, yeah. a few times. But um, I do have a lot of energy. And, you know, I don't know. I just speak very fast. I bring, my brain works really fast. And it's I don't proof, know of, it's so. proof of intelligence. I, again, I guess, it's not yeah, a terrible yeah, thing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I but just, I, I wonder, you know, like, if, if people might, respond a little bit better with just a little bit more breathing room. Yeah, you know, I, I think I realized that, um, I guess it was last year when I was talking to a client and uh, um, 
they were like, wait, what? And they keep saying, wait, well, hold on, hold on, right? I'm like, okay, you know, that, that, a few clients said that to me, and I was like, okay, I, I probably talk too much. It's well, not I talk too much. Too fast, right? So I, I try to work on that, but it's kind of like a subconscious thing, you know. I can't really, even though like English is not my first native language, but I, I just tend to like naturally speak very fast. You're very, very fast at it. Yeah, I'm sorry well, for some. No, no, no. no don't be there. sorry. Don't be sorry. Um, but. Now let's work with that. Right? Yeah. My point to you is that your strongest value words are coming out at the same speed as the things <laughs> that are lower value, mm. right? And it's like when you really need to accentuate a point, that dramatic pause can be your friend. Right. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk sort of about like where does China fit in the world, right? Because, right. because a lot has changed. You know, um, the world's electronics for the mm -hmm. most part, are made in China. Mm -hmm. um, the, the economy of the world has changed quite mm -hmm. a bit. And, and you're participating in that. And I'm just curious, yeah. like, what's your take on it as opposed to like maybe some of the people you run into in the course of a day? You know, China has changed so much that people don't even realize how much it has changed, especially for people in the U.S. and other countries that, you know, not native Chinese people, right? Right. And, you know, I think it was uh, since 1979 when uh, a leader of China came out and said, okay, you know, I don't care if it's capitalism or, or communist or whatever, you know, we're going to do it as, as long as the system makes our uh, citizens rich and make, okay. makes the, 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 the economy better. Right. right. So, this is a very pragmatic approach. Yes. So because, you know, it was it was a bad time and everybody was poor, like literally everyone is poor in that country. Right? Oh, terrible. And then the leader said, you know what, we're, we're done with this and we want something uh, um, better. And discussing the, the theory is not going to help us with that. Right. So we're going to just go and, and figure it out as we go. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the perspective. Right. Just right. knowing what else is out there as opposed to just taking things for granted and, mm -hmm. and, and kind of just being curious about it. And here you are. I have to believe you get back there fairly regularly. Yeah. 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 You yeah, see your yeah. folks. Every every summer pretty much. You know, I I, I usually go travel. Yeah. Um I go back, I visit my family and then, you know, I I'll just go to different uh, uh cities. Have they been here? No. You gotta bring them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we gotta show them around. See, this is this is what my dad told me. He said he until you graduate from college, I am not going oh, to the United States. Oh, that's dirty pool. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, really? You got to tell your dad yeah. that we're taking him somewhere. <laughs> okay. You and me and Mrs. Wang, Mrs. McTaggart <laughs> are going to go out and, and we're going to bring Buzzy and Buzzy's going to take photos and we're going we're gonna to sure. capture just because the initial reaction is going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, That'd be fun anyway. I mean, yeah. just, just to have fun. It's fun to bring people into the city even when they're from like <laughs> Cleveland, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you, get in touch with Quebble, how do they do that? You know, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, or you can call. Can I say my phone number here? Of course. Yeah. You can, you can just call me at 610-704-1757. Yeah. And, or you can go on website. Uh, it's quibblesolutions.com, spelled as Q-U-E-B-L-E solutions. Dot com. There you go. And then you can see a lot of sample work. You know, we, we, we put out a lot of uh, design samples every week. We call it uh, weekly design for fun. Yeah, so I saw that. You saw that? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, what do you call it? Um, like a free sample. You get right, to, right. You get to see what we do and what's how we do actually it, right? being produced. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we don't necessarily like, you know, put out like uh, uh, products that we do for clients. Well, you can't. Right, due to like privacy policy and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But we have a dedicated design team that, you know, uh, will show you what we design. They will, I told them, I said, you know, go nuts. Don't don't care about style or theme or do whatever you want that usually you can't do for a product pro a product, and just have fun and then show people uh, what you're really passionate about, right? So our designers are just awesome. They post out like, you know, two, uh, uh, four to six design piece every week. And I post them online to show people, you know. Uh, this little, is what's little, possible. Yeah, exactly. And, and and especially to show them that Asian designers can also be good and better than they think, right? And well, I mean, just, it's a 5,000 year old civilization. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were bound to, to get something right eventually, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, what were the chances that they were <laughs> all going to be terrible at art? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson Wang, thanks for coming into the Epicast Studios. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, that's all the time we've got this week. Thanks to Jackson Wang. Be sure to check out quebblesolutions.com if you've got any sort of big idea planned. You know, you got something in the wings and you're, you're considering maybe actually making it a reality. Uh, I think a lot of us have these ideas, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder when 
Uh, you try to do it on your own. You don't have the right budget set up. You don't have the right project plan set up. And you just don't know where to go. You kind of feel like you're spinning your wheels. Get a little bit of help. Talk to Jackson. He gave you his phone number. And just see whether or not there's a path forward on this. There's no reason not to at least give it a shot. Um, obviously, we're going to be back in about seven days. I do appreciate you tuning in this week and every week. I hope you'll catch us next Wednesday. Take care of yourself in the meantime. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S dot com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.